Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church of Easton. For folks here in our beautiful sanctuary and folks on this rainy day that are joining us at home, I'm Pastor Stephanie Munsell and I welcome you on this day that the Lord has made. It is a communion Sunday in the season of Lent. If you are at home, I hope you have your communion elements ready. Um, today, uh, the bread that we share in the sanctuary is matzah. It is unleavened bread that reminds us of the Passover meal that Jesus shared um, during this season um, of Lent. A few announcements for the life of our church. Today we are beginning our Lenten Soup and Scripture series. Uh, we'll meet downstairs in uh, Fellowship Hall. The resource that we are using is um, called What My Grandmother Taught Me, and we will be looking at the names of women from Matthew's uh, ge genealogy of Jesus. And we'll be looking at our own family trees and our own family stories. So I hope if you've signed up, please join us today. And if you haven't signed up, please join me today. We'll be downstairs um, at, one, at noon to share that time together. Um, in March, we again receive donations of pasta um, or jams and jellies. We're doing that today. You can drop them off um, until Tuesday, March 8th. Um, and they'll be brought to Project's Food Pantry. Please note that Brunch Bunch is meeting again and um, will meet on Sunday, March 13th after worship. And you'll note that we do not have Bible study on that Sunday so that we don't um, have conflicting events happening. So uh, please join Brunch Bunch and you can notify Ruth Ann if you'd like to join that fellowship time. Uh, I hope that you will be thinking about concrete ways that you can mark the season of Lent in your lives. Um, one of the ways that folks have historically marked Lent is through fasting. And um, some of us uh, traditionally have just given up chocolate. That's sort of something that we've offhandedly done. And I invite you to maybe reflect on some more intentional ways that you might think about how you consume food because that connects to our mission project. Um, as we fast, we can be aware of the people in the world that are hungry. And in that intentional reflection, um, we can uh, both strengthen our faith and our thanksgiving to God for the food that we have and the generosity that we can share. Speaking of generosity, um, this will be the last Sunday that I remind us um, for a little while of uh, an invitation to give your per capita. Um, a per capita is uh, an amount that we give to be part of the nation, National Presbyterian Church. Uh, this year it is $43.13. We ask that every confirmed, every active member give that amount. Um, if you'll give it to our church, we then pass it along. A part of that stays local to help with mission through our local presbytery. Some stays in the region, goes to our synod, and a little bit also goes to the national church. So help us be connected to other Presbyterians by giving that uh, per capita. Speaking of giving, uh, folks have been incredibly generous um, by giving and supporting our blessing box, which is outside. And my goodness, it is being used so well by our neighbors. So thank you if you have somebody who have, has filled the blessing box. If you would like to uh, sign up again, we welcome you to do that. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet by our office, and you can also simply call the church. Another announcement is that we do need greeters for Sunday mornings. Um, greeters are uh, sort of reduced. It used to be that there were more tasks for our ushers, but this truly is a greeter, somebody who would come, um, hand out bulletins, and make sure that our offering is secure. If you might be willing to come just a little bit early to worship and be a greeter, we would welcome that. In this season, we continue with our midweek meditations um, at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays. I hope you will join us for that. 
If you would like to host a fellowship hour, we don't have fellowship today, but if you would like to host fellowship hour, then we will have fellowship hour after worship. So please consider hosting, um, and you can also be a helper so that it's not too much on one person. So please consider signing up for that. And finally, um, some good news, our, our handbells uh, choir is going to resume um, this coming Wednesday, March 9th. If you'd like to join them, I think you could probably just show up. Would that be fair to say, Gloria? Okay. Um, Wednesday at uh, 6.30 to 7.15, come and learn how to play bells or come back um, and jo enjoy the fellowship and the music of that choir. And we will give you updates on um, what our chancel choir can do in this season. Um, I'll, I'm very happy to share that our choir director, Elizabeth, is doing very well. Um, brain surgery is no small thing. And so her recovery, you know, we're, we're hoping it'll be speedy, but she'll need some time for recovery. And so many folks have gathered around the family to provide food, and they are just so thankful for this church family um, and the other ways that we are providing practical ways to um, support them as uh, Peter helps care for Elizabeth and Ella um, and his mother-in-law. Um, just thank you for your prayers and continue to pray for her. She really is doing well. Um, and we hope that in the not too distant future, we can hear her voice again here in worship. Those are my announcements for today. Is there anything that I have missed? Hearing none. Oh, I did want to mention that we, we are um, already preparing. Uh, our worship team is meeting today, and we are already looking ahead to Easter. Um, if you're somebody who would like to sign up for flowers, there are sheets um, in the rear of the sanctuary, and there might be a few up front as well, or you can call um, the church office to sign up to um, decorate in our worship space with Palm Sunday or Easter flowers. And as long as I'm talking about worship, um, I know that many of you are probably as tired as I am of wearing these masks, and um, worship team is meeting today. We are aware that the CDC has changed its guidelines, and I'm expecting that we will be updating our policies um, around masking. So um, uh, please be on the lookout for more information in the coming week. And thank you for your continued patience and your care for one another as you have been so wonderful about wearing uh, masks and taking precautions to keep each other safe. Uh, this is truly what Jesus has called us to do, so thank you. Um, and we look forward to sharing more information with you in the near future. Those are truly all my announcements. And so I invite you to turn with me to our bulletin and to speak the words in bold for the call to worship as we hear God's voice calling us, God's people, together through technology and in this space as we worship God. Holy God, creator of life, you call us out of our dark places offering us the light of new life. You are the resurrection and the life. Seeing nothing but hopelessness, you surprise us with the wonder of new life. You are the resurrection and the life. Stuck in no longer useful routines and mindsets, you set us free from self-imposed bonds, giving us the grace of new life. You are the resurrection and the life. Let us come to worship in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life.
seated. Trusting in God's mercy and grace, may we all join together in this morning's prayer of confession, followed by time of silent prayer. Let us pray. Holy One, we call to you in our grief, and you come. Yet we do not trust that you care for us or for the people we love. We do not believe that you want full and abundant life for us. Forgive us for our doubt and mistrust of you. Help us to embrace patience, perspective, and perseverance when we are faced with desperate and despairing times. In you is our hope, but we turn away from you when we need you the most. Forgive us for getting how precious and fragile all life is. Forgive us for holding too tightly to what gifts we have in our lives, instead of sharing so that all your beloved people may thrive and flourish. Forgive us our selfishness. Call us out of the darkness and into the light. Call us out of despair into hope. Call us out of injustice and war into peace and love. Help us to hear and listen to you, our hope and source of life. Amen. Brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, believe the good news that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. You have been forgiven. Amen. There was a man named Lazarus who was sick. He lived in the town of Bethany, where Mary and her sister Martha lived. Mary is the same woman who put perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. But Mary's brother was Lazarus, the man who was now sick. So Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Jesus arrived in Bethany and found that Lazarus had already been dead and in the tomb for four days. Bethany was about two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to see Martha and Mary. They came to comfort them about their brother Lazarus. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to greet him, but Mary stayed home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you anything you ask. Jesus said, Your brother will rise and be alive again. Martha answered, I know that he will rise to live again at the time of the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, I am life. Everyone who believes in me will have life, even if they die. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never really die. Martha, do you believe this? Martha answered, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You are the one who was coming to the world. After Martha said these things, she went back to her sister Mary. 
She talked to Mary alone and said, The teacher is here. He is asking for you. Mary went to the place where Jesus was. When she saw him, she bowed at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw Mary crying and the people with her crying too, he was very upset and deeply troubled. He asked, Where did you put him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept, and the Jews said, Look, he loved Lazarus very much. But some of them said, Jesus healed the eyes of the blind man. Why didn't he help Lazarus and stop him from dying? Again, feeling very upset, Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave with a large stone covering the entrance. He said, Move the stone away, Martha said. But Lord, it has been four days since Lazarus died. There will be a bad smell. Martha was the sister of the dead man. Then Jesus said to her, Remember what I told you. I said that if you believed, you would see God's divine greatness. So they moved the stone away from the entrance. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said these things because of the people here around me. I want them to believe that you sent me. After Jesus said this, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with pieces of cloth. He had a handkerchief covering his face. Jesus said to the people, take off the cloth and let him go. Let us pray. O Holy One, you come to us in our darkest hours. Let us hear your word and receive you as the resurrection and the life. In Christ's name, amen. So friends, today we heard the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, three adult siblings from Bethany. They have history with Jesus. Yes, they are followers. But what is clear is that they are also friends with Jesus. They have reason to trust Jesus both as a human being and as God's revelation on earth. And so, when Lazarus falls gravely ill, his sisters, Mary and Martha, they send for Jesus. But Jesus is not close. He is across the Jordan. We see this in verses 10, 40, and in the beginning of chapter 11. Jesus' response to this news that his good friend is gravely ill kind of surprisingly relaxed, given the gravity of Lazarus' state. Though Jesus was moved by Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Two days. Now we... We as readers, we have the insight, which the sisters don't. We can read that Jesus is confident that Lazarus' illness will not lead to death. And yet, by the time that Jesus finally gets to Bethany, Lazarus is already dead and buried. Both Mary and Martha greet Jesus, their friend, separately. But each one of them says pretty much the same thing. Did you hear it? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Let's look at their response. Implied in this statement are questions. Where were you, Jesus? Why did you take so long getting here? I thought you loved my brother. I thought you cared about us. The questions, but also the slight accusation. 
Did you hear it? Don't you care? If you cared, wouldn't you have come? You could have stopped this. This is your fault. Some of the neighbors gathered around echoed that same sentiment. Verse 37 tells us that they were thinking, could not he, Jesus, who opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man from dying? Where were you, Jesus? Why are you taking so long to set things right? I have profound empathy for Mary and Martha. Many of us have endured watching someone close to us fight through an illness or a medical condition. Some of you have had close family members even die in that position. I have yet to experience that. The closest I've ever come is the loss of my own grandmother when I was young. And I agonized because she was an ocean away. And my mother came up with a way for me to express my sadness that she was so ill and was likely to pass. She helped me um, purchase a blanket. And I knew from my grandmother's visits, uh, my grandmother was in Germany, so she was very far away. I knew from my grandmother's visits over the summer that she loved the smell of lavender. And so we took a blanket and we packed it up and put lavender um, sprigs in with the blanket. And my, my uncle promised that he would wrap that blanket around my grandmother. And indeed, it was around her when, when her final day came. But I can't imagine the loss of a brother. For Mary and Martha to watch their beloved brother slowly pass away when they thought there was another hope, a hope that Jesus would come and just divinely intervene, I can only imagine their pain and their frustration and their confusion. And the truth is that their personal situation represents something else for us as human beings. It represents a reality that we as human beings have often had with God. Tragedy comes into our lives and into this world and we, in our pain, think, God, where are you? If only you would listen to our cries, if you would only listen to our prayers, why? Why do you let these evil, bad, hard, awful things in the world happen? Why do you allow men who don't care about peace to rise to great power and start wars. Why, God? Why do you allow a virus like COVID to spread and to take so many lives? Why, God? How can you allow well-fought fights for liberty and equity and justice for all to lose ground and to let bigoted and narrow-minded voices have such power in our world? Why? Have there been times in your life when you have looked around and seen tragedy and wondered, where is God? The cry that Mary and Martha had for Jesus is familiar. It's the cry of the psalmist in lament. And it is our cry as well. Where are you, O oh God? I know it is the cry of the couple whose marriage is failing. It is the cry of the man who has lost his job. It is the cry of the child who is being bullied, of the nurse who is tired and stressed, 
of the grandparent who is lonely, of the addict who is struggling to stay clean, of the cancer survivor waiting for news from the doctor. Where are you, Jesus? If only you had come sooner, our brother would be alive. At its core, I think Mary and Martha simply felt that Jesus just didn't care enough. And I think likewise, when we question God, when we accuse God of not stopping cancer or war or hurt feelings or job loss or whatever it may be, at the heart of our accusation is the the fear and the doubt that God simply doesn't love us enough to stop the evil, the wrong, the war, the virus, to stop death itself. So what can we take from this story of Mary and Martha, of Lazarus and Jesus, to help us when we lose faith and have doubts in God's love for the world. First, we should trust that God does care, and this story shows us. Maybe if you are um, a connoisseur of, of Bible trivia, you will know what the shortest verse in the entire New Testament is. Jesus wept. And it is in our scripture today. Jesus wept. Jesus cried for his friend, Lazarus, for the pain that he saw that his sisters were going through, for the grief of the community. Jesus wept. Jesus' tears in this scripture today remind us that God does care. While it might not be fair to totally anthropomorphize God, we can look to Jesus as God's incarnate son and presence among us and see that God is full of compassion for the tragedies and hardships that we go through. Jesus wept. Jesus loves his friends. He cared for this pain, and he loves you. He loves this creation. He knows us by name and cares about every single anguish in our lives. Jesus wept. Secondly, note that we can trust that God does respond to our requests for help in times of trouble. God does draw near. Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus, and Jesus came. God draws near to us when we need God. God is with each family in Ukraine that is staying put or fleeing to find safety. God is there. God is with each Russian parent who is had no say in seeing their young son sent off to war. God comes. God is present. Now, it is true that sometimes our timeline for when we think God should intervene is not the same as God's timeline. Jesus was never not going to come to Lazarus' aid. Jesus was never not going to come. But Mary and Martha didn't know that. And so they have to wait. They have to wait for God's timing. And waiting when we need God is scary. It's hard on us human beings because guess what? We like to know the timeline. We like to be in control. It's hard to be patient and to allow God's presence to be seen and felt and known. Now, I also want you to notice that in this story, the good news 
is that at no point are Mary and Martha ever alone. Even when Jesus has not yet come, their community encircles them. And I have to wonder, what would their experience of waiting for Jesus to show up, what would their experience have been like if they trusted that Jesus was coming in friendship and care and in faithfulness? And what if they had taken comfort from the support of their community? Friends, I believe that today's passage reminds us that in the midst of hardship, we can trust God who cares deeply for the hurt of our human pain and struggle. I believe it reminds us that while not exactly on our timeline, that God shows up. And finally, here in this season of Lent, we can't ignore the almost unbelievable intervention that Jesus makes on behalf of Lazarus. There's a reason we read this scripture in Lent. Lazarus is not asleep, but dead. All hope is gone. Death seems to have won. And yet, Jesus speaks. Jesus speaks so that all who are present can witness and know that what is about to happen, the great gift of life that is about to happen, comes from his Father. Jesus speaks, and Lazarus rises to new life. This is a foreshadowing of the coming of Easter for us a foreshadowing of Jesus' own experience of when we, he will enter the tomb. Jesus will face death. And then the loving power of God will intervene and raise Jesus to new life. And in Lazarus' story is the promise to us that no matter the hardship we can trust the faithfulness and promise of Christ. That life in all its abundance is offered to us. Today I ask you to understand that what Jesus does that day for Mary and Martha and Lazarus and the whole community is to reveal the character and the power of God. Jesus so clearly reveals to us that God is caring, that, draw, that God draws close to us in our suffering, and that God is the power of goodness which overcomes evil, that God is the life which will and does conquer death itself. Professor Elizabeth Johnson puts it so succinctly, even as we cry from the depths, however, we wait and live in hope. Like Mary and Martha, we learn that God does not act exactly when and where or how we think God should act, but God will act in God's good time, and death will not have the final word, and the day of resurrection will come. So today, so this week, as you watch news reports about war, as you see division and racism and bigotry and greed and so many other sins of this world, as you see cancer and addiction and illness and depression and death its very self, in your lives, in the lives of people you love, in our communities, as you struggle with your own challenges, have hope. Hold on. Don't let despair define who you are or how you respond to what you witness. God has heard the cry of his people 
God draws near. God is loving and life-giving. And today we taste that promise when we taste bread and juice, as we share fellowship at God's table. He is the resurrection and the life. Choose to wait with hope. Choose to act with love because this is the way of our friend and our redeemer. Amen and thanks be to God. And now, let us come to Christ's table. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Let those who have no money come and eat. God will satisfy your souls with a rich feast and will bless the Lord as long as we live. Will you join me in the great prayer of thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We will lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God, our creator and redeemer. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image to love and to serve you. When we were slaves in Egypt, you freed us and led us through the waters of the sea. You fed us with heavenly food in the wilderness and satisfied our thirst from desert springs. On a holy mountain, you gave us the law to guide us in your way. Through the waters of Jordan, you led us into the land of your promise, and you sustained us in times of trial. You spoke through prophets, calling us to turn from our willful ways to new obedience and righteousness. And in your own time, you sent your only Son to be the way to eternal life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the choirs of angels, with all the faithful in every time and place who forever sing your praise, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who took upon himself the weight of our sin, who carried the burden of our guilt. He shared our life in every way, and though tempted, was sinless to the end. Baptized by your own, he went willingly to his death and by your power was raised to new life. In his dying and rising, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from sin to death, from from slavery and sin and death, and made us a new covenant by water and spirit. And so we remember the night that Jesus gathered with his community, with his family, at a table. And he took bread unleavened bread to remember the coming of the Passover. And he took the bread and he broke it. 
And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Whenever you share this, remember me. And in the same way, he took cup and he blessed it. And he reminded those gathered that this cup was a cup of God's covenant with God's people, a promise. And Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you share it, Remember me. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holding offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. May your spirit unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, and that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ for the world. Lord, be with your world in this time of war. Let us remember the people of Ukraine and all the other places across our globe where there is armed conflict and violence, where refugees seek new life and safety. Christ, have mercy. Holy One, bring healing to the people in our prayers to the people we know by name. Bring your spirit of peace to our hearts where we struggle with hardship. Holy One, bring your peace and healing. Help us to be obedient to your call, to love all your children, to do justice and to show mercy, and to live in peace with your whole creation. Guide us through the desert of this life. Quench our thirst with living waters. Satisfy our hunger with the bread of heaven. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with all the redeemed of all ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. And let the people pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Take now and receive. 
know that you are welcome at God's table. The gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. 
We thank you, O God, that through word and sacrament you have given us your Son, who is the true bread from heaven and food of eternal life. So strengthen us in your service that, your da- that our daily lives may show our thanks. Offer your peace to our broken world and lift up those who are burdened by grief, illness, or injustice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Let us give thanks to God at all times and for everything that God has provided and in gratitude offer to God a portion of what God has given to us. Please make your gifts in the plate in the back of the sanctuary, online or through the mail. Thanks be to God. Now, may the spirit of our triune God strengthen and sustain you all throughout these 40 days and into the life that is to come. Go in peace, proclaiming the message of reconciliation and peace that God has entrusted to us. Alleluia. Amen. 